Hi guys, uh, my name is IBM and I am solving a Physics 9702 paper 4. This is Cambridge, uh, A-level structured equations. This is paper 4.2. My email is cvi22 at gmail.com. Do not forget to subscribe, like the videos, share. Do not also forget to follow the, uh, the, uh, the topical past paper questions that have been solved across all the topics of AS and A-level. So without wasting time, I would like to take you to the question paper and we solve it. So this is the question paper, uh, February, March 2022, paper 4970242. I will not go through the instructions. We are used to the instructions. I will go straight to the, um, I will not go through the data, the formula. You can go through the data, formula, and constants. I will just go straight. To, uh, the first question. The point P in the figure represents a point mass. On the figure, draw lines to represent the gravitational field around the P. Of course, we know that uh, the, the gravitational force is always attractive, so I'll just draw field lines pointing towards P. So, draw radial field lines. They didn't specify the number, so I can draw at least the minimum can be four. Okay, so the arrows should be pointing towards the center because the um, the gravitational field is always attractive. Okay, as simple as that. The, all the arrows should be pointing uh, towards the center. And uh, at least four, you can draw at least four field lines. So I could draw as many as I want. A moon is in a circular orbit around a planet. Explain why the path of the moon is circular. Of course, if the path is circular, it means uh, the moon is experiencing centripetal force. And what is providing the centripetal force? It must be the gravitational field or the gravitational force between the moon and the planet. And why does the gravitational force provide the centripetal force? It is because, first of all, the gravitational force is constant and it is always perpendicular to the direction of motion of, of the moon. So we shall simply say the gravitational force is constant. The gravitational force is constant and perpendicular or and always perpendicular. and always perpendicular to the direction the direction of motion or to the velocity of the moon to the direction of motion of the moon so what is the effect so the gravitational force provides the same pet of force so Gravitational force simply provides the centripetal force. So, because the gravitational force is constant and is always perpendicular to the direction of motion, it doesn't change uh, the speed but it just provides the centripetal force. Okay. Many moons are in a circular orbit about a planet. The angular velocity of a moon is omega when the orbit of the moon has a radius r about the planet. The figure shows the variation of r cubed with 1 over omega, omega squared for these moons. 
okay so we have the graph here which is of r cubed against one over omega show that mass m of the planet is given by the expression m is equal to the gradient where g is uh, the gravitational gradient of g where g is the, gra uh, the gravitational constant okay so since I've already mentioned that the gravitational force provides centripetal force, I'll just equate the two. So uh, the gravitational force is going to be capital G, capital M times the mass of the moon, divided by the radius of orbit squared, should be equal to the centripetal force, which is M V squared over R. And I want you to also remember the, uh, the speed V is equal to omega times R. So a uh, small m has cancelled. One of the R's has cancelled, so I have that capital G, capital M over R is equal to V squared. But remember, V is omega R, so I will say that capital G M over R is going to be where there is V. I'm putting omega R, but this is squared. So this means when I make um, M the subject, M is going to be equal to omega squared R cubed divided by capital G. Omega is a constant, the radius is a constant, G is also a constant, so I will simply say, um, when you look at the graph, the gradient of the graph, so the gradient, because it goes through zero, the gradient is going to be um, R cubed, the gradient is change in R cubed over change in 1 over omega squared which is going to be which is the same as r cubed over 1 over omega squared so the gradient is going to be r cubed times omega squared so it means uh, omega squared times r cubed is the gradient so I'll simply say omega squared r cubed is equal to the gradient Hence, M is simply going to be the gradient divided by G. Okay. So M is the gradient divided by G. Use uh, figure 1.2 and the expression in serum and want to show that the mass m of the planet is 1.0 times 10 to the power of 26 kilograms. So we have just mentioned that m is equal to the gradient divided by g. m equals to the gradient divided by g. So the gradient, I'll just choose values from the line. Uh, let me take this this point here. I think this is 4.1 times 10 to the power of 23. That is against 6 times 10 to the power of, of 7. So 6 minus 0, 4.1 minus 0. So that is the gradient. So I'll just simply say 4.1 times 10 to the power of 23. Divide by 6.0 times 10 to the power of 7, that is the gradient. Then times 1 over g, which is 1 over g is 6.67 times 10 to the power of minus 11, that is the gravitational constant. So we can check with the calculator. 4.1 exponent 23 divided by um, 6 exponent 7. I will again divide by 6.67 exponent negative 11. So that's 1.02 times 10 to the power of 26. So this is 1.0 times 10 to the power of 26 as required. Determine the radius, I mean, determine the speed of a moon in orbit. Sorry, this is kilograms. Determine the speed of a moon in orbit around the planet with an orbital radius of 1.2 times 10 to the power of 8 meters. So, we have already seen that uh, the gravitational force provides centripetal force. So, we have already seen that G up to M small m over R squared is the same as M 
v squared of r. We want the speed. So v squared is going to be small m as cancelled, 1 r as cancelled. v squared is going to be capital G, m over r. So I'm going to find the square root for v. So v is going to be the square root of capital G is 6.67 times 10 to the power of minus 11. We have seen the mass is 1.0 times 10 to the power of 24. Determine the speed of the moon in orbit around the planet. The mass of the planet is 1.0 times 10 to the power of 24. Sorry, power 26, not 24. Then divide, divide by the radius of orbit which has been given as 1.2 times 10 to the power of 8. Okay, so I'll just press my calculator. 6.67 exponent minus 11 times 1.0 exponent 26. Divide by open brackets 1.2 exponent 8. Then I find the square root of the answer. So it is 7455, which is approximately 75,000. So I'll just take um, 7455.4, which is approximately 75, no, it is 7500, 7, not 75,000. 7,500 meters per second. So that is the end of question number one. Question number one is always gravitation, which is always very easy. Question number two should be heat. A fixed mass of ideal gas has a volume V and a pressure P. The gas undergoes a cycle of changes, X to Y, Y to Z, and Z to X. You see that is a complete cycle where we are starting from X and we are stopping to X, at X. That means initial temperature is going to be the same as the final temperature. So that means the total change in internal energy is zero. As long as, because internal energy is directly proportion to temperature, if the initial temperature is the same as the final temperature, then it means the change in internal energy is equal to zero. So that means the initial internal energy is the same as the final internal energy. So the change is zero. Okay, the table 2.1 shows data for P, V, and T for the gas at point X, Y, and Z. Set the change in internal energy for one complete cycle. As long as it's one complete cycle, the change in internal energy is zero. Because the initial temperature, I've said, that if we started from X, the temperature at X is the initial temperature. We are stopping at X. The temperature at X is the same as the initial temperature. So that means the change in internal energy is going to be zero. Capture the amount of uh, the amount n of of gas. That is number of moles. So from the ideal gas equation, PV is equal to n R T. So number of moles is going to be equal to PV divided by R T. So P is um, for I will just use the values uh, the the parts which are given. X they have given us P, V, and T. So I will say P is 1.5 times 10 to the power of 5. Then V is given as 4.2 times 10 to the power of minus 3. Of course, the molar gas constant is 8.31. You can check in the list of constants. The temperature in Kelvin is 540. So I will just press my calculator. 1.5 exponent 5 times 4.2 exponent minus 3 then divide by 8.31 times 540 which gives us 0 0.1404 so I will write 0 0.14 to significant figures Please avoid writing any answer which is not exact to less than two significant figures. The minimum should be two unless mentioned, or unless the answer is exact, or unless it is an uncertainty, especially in AS. Complete the table 2.1, use, use the space below for any working. Okay. So uh, the number of moles for the same gas, the number of moles is going to remain constant. So I will just be checking. Um, 
Do I need to calculate the volume for y? The volume for y is the same as the volume for z. Do I know the volume for z? No. Okay. Then the pressure for x, because along x to x to y pressure is constant, so the pressure for x is the same as the pressure for y. So pressure for x is 1.5, so pressure for y is 1.5 without calculation. Pressure for y is 1.5 because it is a horizontal line that is constant pressure. So if I get volume for z, I will have found volume for y. Okay, let me just find volume for z. So volume for z is the same as volume for, for y. So this is going to be uh, the number of moles times R times T over the pressure. Just use PV is equal to NRT. The number of moles is 0.14. R is 8.31. The temperature for Z, Z is 782. So it is times 782 divided by the pressure for Z is 5.1. So that is 5.1 times 10 to the power of 5. So I'll just press my calculator 0 0.14 times 8.31 times 782 divided by 5.1 exponent 5. That is 1.78 or 1.8. 1.78 uh, meters, is it meters? No, times 10 to the power of minus 3. Times 10 to the power of minus 3 meters cube. So which is approximately 1.8. So the volume here is 1.8. And since it was a vertical line, the volume of Y is the same as volume of Z. So I will just write here 1.8. As simple as that. The first law of thermodynamics, the first law of thermodynamics, uh, for a system may be represented by the equation, change in internal energy is equal to Q plus W. So all these are positive, so there will be increases. So because all of them are positives, they should be increased. For example, delta U is going to be increased in internal energy of the system. So this is increase in internal energy of the system. You don't just write a change. It is increase because it is positive. Then uh, Q is also positive, so it will be thermal energy added to the system or supplied to the system. Thermal energy supplied to the system. Then W is also a positive, so we can say work done on. If it is positive, it is work done on. If it is negative, it is work done by. If it is Q positive, it is thermal energy to the system. If it is Q negative, it is thermal energy released by the system. So this is going to be work done on the system. Okay, explain how the first law of thermodynamics applies to the change z to y. So let's check z to y. So one, z to y, I'm sorry, z to x, it is z to x, change from z to x. First of all, from z to x, the, we are seeing volume is increasing. Remember, work done is equal to pressure times change in volume. There's an increase in volume 
An increase in volume means work is done by the system, so work done by the system is negative. Work is done by the system because the volume increases, the work is done by the system, which is negative. Then we also see that uh, the temperature at X, let's check temperature at X is 540, and temperature at Z is 720, 782. And temperature is directly proportional to change in internal energy. The temperature has decreased. A change in temperature is directly proportional to a change in internal energy. There has been a decrease in temperature, so there has been a decrease in internal energy. Okay. So, first of all, to begin with, there is an increase in volume. There is an increase in volume. There's an increase in volume, so is work is done by the gas. Because the volume increases from Z to X, work is done by the gas. That work is negative. Number two, we saw that the temperature decreases. The temperature from Z to X decreases from 782 to 540. So the temperature decreases. And if temperature decreases, we say internal energy decreases. So internal energy So from Z to X, internal energy decreases, as simple as that. Okay. Question three is simple harmonic motion, I think. A small wooden block of mass M floats in water as shown in the figure. The top face of the block is horizontal and has area A. The density of the water is rho. State the names of the two forces acting on the block when it is stationary. If it is stationary, we only have the upward force, which is up thrust, and the downward force, which is weight. If it was moving downwards, there will be another force, which is viscous drag upward. So here I have the weight. And the up thrust. The block is now displaced. Notice how it was oriented here. It, uh, a small portion of it was submerged. Now, when we push it deeper, we are increasing the, the, the uh, we are increasing the depth which is submerged. So it means the up thrust, which is cross sectional area times difference in pressure. The up thrust is cross sectional area times difference in pressure, which is um, which is going to be density times g times difference in height. So when you push it deeper, this difference in the height increases, so the up thrust is increasing. Okay, the block is now displaced downwards, as shown in the figure, so that the surface of the water is higher up the block. State and explain the direction of the resultant force. So the upward force, the up thrust has increased. The weight is remaining constant. Initially, they were equal if it was in equilibrium. So Displacing downwards increases the up thrust. Displacing downwards increases the up thrust. Decreases downwards increases the up thrust. So the up thrust is now greater than the weight. So, the up thrust is now greater than, is now greater than the weight. So, the result, hence, I'll just use hence, resultant force is upwards, hence, the resultant force is upwards. Pushing deeper increase the up, up thrust beyond the weight. 
So the upthrust is now greater than the weight. That means the resultant force is upwards because upthrust is an upward force. The block in B is now released so that it oscillates vertically. The resultant force F acting on the block is given by F is equal to a g rho x. Remember, A was cross sectional area, G is acceleration due to gravity, and rho is density. Okay, where G is the gravitational field strength, and X is the vertical displacement of the block from the equilibrium position. Explain why the oscillations of the block are simple harmonic. A simple harmonic. Of course, A is cross sectional area, which is a constant, G is a constant, rho is a constant, which means F is the actual proportion to X. So I'll simply say A, G, and rho. These are all constants. Are all constants. What does that mean? So it means the force F is the actual proportion to 2 x that's one number two there's a minus the minus means that f and x are always in opposite directions so the minus the minus sign means that f and x always in opposite directions f and x are always in opposite directions so that is automatically simple harmonic motion remember for simple harmonic motion the force or the acceleration remember force is ma so the force is the actual proportion to acceleration the force or the acceleration are directly proportional to the displacement. The two are always in opposite directions. So those conditions satisfy symphonic. Show that the angular frequency omega of the oscillation is given by this expression. So angular frequency. So we know that the force F is equal to M times A, which is the same as negative. Okay. So which means that the acceleration is going to be F over M. So which implies that the acceleration A is equal to F and F was negative A G rho times X. This is divided by M. So I'm going to compare with compare with uh, acceleration is equal to negative omega squared x. So when we compare, we notice that um, omega squared, because this is a negative, there's a negative here, so omega squared is going to be a g rho divided by m, which means if I find a square root, both sides, so it means omega is going to be called the square root of a g rho divided by m as simple as that the block is now uh, placed in a liquid with a greater density the block is displaced and released so that it oscillates vertically the variation with the displacement x of the acceleration a of the block is measured for the first half oscillation for the first half oscillation okay as shown in the figure Explain why the maximum negative displacement of the block is not equal to its maximum positive displacement. So they have measured this for the first half oscillation, and as we are seeing that the maximum negative is not the same as the maximum positive. Perhaps there is damping. So most likely damping because it is in a liquid, so damping due to viscous forces in the liquid. So damping. Explain why the maximum negative, so there could be damping, so there is damping. Due to viscous 
forces of of the water or of the liquid so as as the the block starts moving the viscous forces start acting so there is damping due to viscous forces of the liquid the viscous forces act in the opposite direction to motion so they reduce its maximum displacement then the mass of the block is 0 0.57 kilograms use the figure to determine the decrease uh, delta E in energy of the oscillation for the first half oscillation for decrease in energy of the oscillation for the first half oscillation first of all I will find uh, omega omega from the graph if, if this is a graph of uh, if we have acceleration is equal to negative omega squared x so we have a against x which means the gradient is equal to negative omega squared so I'll first tell the examiner that the gradient equals to negative omega squared or I will say omega squared is equal to the negative of the gradient the gradient itself is negative so it will become a positive so omega squared is going to be the negative of let me find here so this is going to be 2.3 I think 2.3 minus 0 against negative 0 0.2 minus 0 so that is 2.3 minus 0 against a negative 0 0.02 minus 0 so the gradient is going uh, omega squared is going to be equal to 2.3 over 0 0.020 yes that is the grid that is omega squared then i also know that energy is equal to a half m squared times x naught squared that is maximum energy so we want a decrease in energy from for the first half oscillation for the first half oscillation so this is going to be a half omega uh, the mass is 0. Point Five seven. There's an m here. I have m omega squared x naught squared. So this is. Let me write here. The change in energy is going to be equal to a half m omega squared uh, x. Let's say x one squared minus x two squared. That is the change in x values squared. Maximum amplitude. Of course, x is standing for maximum displacement here. So this would be a half 0 0.57 times omega squared, which is 2.3 divided by 0 0.02. But this is squared. No, it is already squared, so I don't square it again. This was already omega squared. Then uh, times x1. Let me check. X1 starts from 0. 0, 02 then here it is 0. 0.1 2 3 4 5 6 0. 0.016 okay so this is going to be 0. 0.02 squared minus 0. 0.016 squared okay I'll check with my calculator I'll start from the right hand side 0 0.02 squared minus 0 0.016 squared then times 2.3 divide by 0 0.02 then times 0 0.57 then divide by 2 so that is 4.7 times 10 to the power of minus 3 4.7 times 10 to the power of minus 3 so this is 4. I moved from here to this step. So this is 4.7 times 10 to the power of minus 3. Okay, I think that is the end of question number 3. Electric fields is here. State what is represented by an electric field line. Of course, the electric field line shows the direction in which a positive charge would move if it was free to do so. The magnetic field shows the direction in which a north pole would move. 
and the gravitational field field line shows the direction in which a mass would move. So this one we shall say it shows it represents the direction direction of force on a positive charge. So a positive charge will move would move in the direction of uh, the electric field. So the electric field always points in the direction of the force on a positive charge. That is an electric field line. Then two point charges P and Q are placed 0.12 meters apart as shown in the figure. The charge of P is plus 4 nanocoulombs and the charge of Q is minus 7.2 nanocoulombs. Determine the distance from P of the point on the line joining the two charges where the electric potential is zero. Of course, we know electric potential. The work done in moving a unit positive charge from infinity to a point is the electric potential. So we know that the electric potential is equal to charge divided by 4 pi epsilon naught times r, where r is the distance between um, the distance between one point to another point. So determine the distance from P of the point on the line joining the two charges where the electric potential is. So let me say there's a point here which is a distance, let's say x. So it means the distance, if this is x, then for Q, it is going to be 0 0.12 minus x. Okay, so I want to find x. So the electric potential at x at, at the point here, which I'm calling B, is going to be zero. So when I sum up the potentials, this is, remember potential is positive for a positive charge and negative for a negative charge. So for a positive charge, it is going to be positive for uh, nanocoulombs. I will not change the nano, so it will be 4.0 nanocoulombs divided by 4 pi epsilon naught times the distance which is x plus the other one is negative so I'll say negative 7.2 nanocoulombs divided by 4 pi epsilon naught and the distance is 0 0.12 minus x. Now we'll change the color and cross out some of the identical things. Nanocoulombs cancels out 4 pi epsilon naught cancels out. Remember, this should be equal to 0 at that point B. Okay. So it means I will say 4 over x should be equal to 7.2 over 0 0.12 minus x. So just cross multiply. So if I cross multiply, I have that what is 4 times 0. 0.12. So I have 0 0.48 minus 4x is equal to 7.2x. I will collect like terms. Um, 4 plus 7.2 plus 4. That is 11.2. So I have 11.2x is equal to 0 0.48. So I'll just divide 0 0.48 by the answer, which is 0 0.4, 0 0.043. So x is equal to 0 0.043 meters. Okay, 0 0.043 meters. State and explain without calculation, without calculation, whether the electric field strength is zero at the same point at which the electric potential is zero. That is automatically not true. It is not true because the electric field at B will always imagine a, pos a positive charge here at B. And the electric field is in the same direction as the force. So if we put a positive charge here, the electric field caused by P is repulsive. The electric field caused by Q is attractive. So E is always going to be towards the negative charge. It is always electric field due to each charge is in the same direction. 
So they sum up. The resultant cannot be zero. So we can say the fields are in the same direction. So the electric field, electric fields due to each charge are in the same direction. In brackets, I will say towards the negative charge. So, the field strength at the same point at which, whether the electric field strength is zero, so it's not zero. Electric fields due to due to electric fields due to each charge are in the same direction, so it's not zero. So the resultant is not zero. Why can't I say so the resultant is not zero? So the resultant is not zero. Okay, I want to explain this again. If we want the electric field at point B or electric field strength at point B, we always put a positive charge there, a unit positive charge. So P repels it to the right, yet because Q is negative, it also attracts it to, to, to the right. So if this is E due to P and this is E due to Q, the resultant electric field strength at B will be E due to P plus E due to Q. So the resultant is going to be to the right hand side. So it's not it's not going to be zero. Okay, an electron is positioned at point X, equidistant from both P and Q as shown in the figure. On the figure, draw an arrow to represent the direction of the resultant force acting on the electron. It is electron, so it is negative. So the charge here is negative. P remember was positive, and Q is negative. Okay. So I'm going to use, uh, let me use a pencil first of all, to come up with the construction. So because Q is negative and X is negative, X is repelled. So the force is going to, the electric field here, this is going to be E caused by, I mean the uh, resultant, the force from Q is going to be in that direction. Then because P is positive, and X is negative, then the force caused uh, by P on X is going to be in this direction. This is the force caused by P on X. Now uh, note that F, F caused by Q is greater than F caused by P. So the resultant cannot be at the center. So the resultant should be very close to FQ rather than to FP because FQ is greater than FP. So I can't draw the resultant as a horizontal line, but if I put a horizontal line for reference, so I'll put a horizontal line here for reference. If, if P was same as Q in magnitude, then the resultant would be just a horizontal line pointing to the left. But because our Q is 7 point, this was 7.2 nanocolumns negative, and this was uh, 4 point, is it 4.2? No, 4.0 nanocolumns. So this is 4.0 nanocolumns. And since it is equidistant, it means the force, the one which is having a greater magnitude causes a greater force. The resultant must be below the horizontal rather than above the horizontal. So it means the resultant must be a line. I will use now blue for the resultant. So the resultant is going to be slightly below the horizontal line. So the result would be somewhere here. So this is going to be the answer for the resultant force. So they said uh, draw an arrow to represent the direction of the resultant force acting on the electron. So this is resultant 
force. This one will be the direction of the resultant force. This is force u to q. This is force u to p. Then I'm saying if they were equal in magnitude, the resultant would be just in the horizontal. But now since fq is greater than fp, then the resultant is closer to fq. So the answer is going to be somewhere there below the horizontal line. Okay. So that is the end of question four. Let's move to question number five. I think question number five should be capacitance. The variation with potential difference V of a charge Q on one of the plates of a capacitor is shown in the figure. So this is charge against, if you remember when a capacitor is fully charged, uh, the PD across the capacitor plates is the same as the, uh, the power supply. The capacitor is connected to an 80 volts power supply and two resistors and R and S as shown. Okay. The resistor, the resistance of R is 25 kilo ohms and the resistance of S is 220 kilo ohms. The switch can be in either position X, of course, in position X to be charging the capacitor, and in position Y it should be discharging across the 220 kilo ohm resistor. The switch is, op is, in open, is in position X so that capacitor is fully charged. Catch the energy E stored in the capacitor. So, of course, we know that the energy stored in the capacitor, let me just say energy, when the capacitor is fully charged, the energy stored is either equal to the area and the graph of charge against V, area under the graph, when I look at the graph, it is a triangle, so I'll say a half QV. So this is a half Q times V, where Q is the maximum charge and V is the maximum PD. So V is, when it is fully, uh, the charge, maximum charge is 1.8 times 10 to the power of minus 4, and V is, V is 12. So I'll say this is going to be, um, times 1.8 times 10 to the power of minus 4 then times 12. So 0 0.5 times 12 times 1.8 exponent minus 4. So this is 1 point, what is this? Ha. Ah. V is 8, sorry. When it is fully charged, it is 8. V is 8, so this is 1.2. So this is not correct. When it is fully charged, V is 8, not 12. And this is 1.2. So this is 1.2. When it is fully charged, from here they are saying V is 8 volts. So I look for 8 volts. When it is fully charged, V is 8, not 12. So this is 1.2 times 8. Okay, sorry about that. So 0 0.5 times 1.2 exponent minus 4 times 8, which is 4.8 times 10 to the power of minus 4. So that is 4.8 times 10 to the power of minus 4. Okay. Then the switch is now moved to position Y, that is now for discharge. Show that the time constant for of the discharge circuit is 3.3 .3 seconds. Of course, we know time constant is the product of the resistance and the capacitance. So the resistance is, when we turn, we turn to Y, the resistance is 220 kilo ohms. And the capacitance, we have already calculated, um, we have the capacitance. I think we can find the capacitance from the graph. Capacitance is equal to charge over V. So the charge 1.2 over V, which is 8. Okay. So time constant is R times C, which is going to be R times the charge divided by V. So this is going to be 220,000. Okay, times 10 to the power of 3, 
the charge was 1.2 times 10 to the power of minus 4 then v was 8.0 so we have 220 exponent 3 times 1.2 exponent minus 4 divided by 8 so that is giving us 3.3 seconds as required then the fully charged capacitor in S towards energy E determine the time T taken for the stored energy to decrease from E to E over 9 so we know that the energy stored is equal to a half CV squared if a half and C are constants I would just simply say energy is directly proportional to V squared so initially let's say the initial energy E is equal to a constant or let me just say a half C times V naught squared that is initial then the energy reduces from E to E over 9 so what is E over 9 should be equal to a half times C then times V squared so what is V I'm just going to combine the two equations so I have a half CV squared divided by a half CV naught squared should be equal to E over 9 divided by E so a half C has cancelled V squared is going to be 1 over 9 times V naught squared when I find the square root I, feel, I see that V is equal to V naught divided by 3 so V naught is going to be I mean V is going to be V naught over 3 if we use E to E so now the equation is V equals to V naught E power negative T over RSC that is for the discharge of a capacitor you must be knowing this expression V is equal to V naught E power negative T over RSC where RSC is the time constant which you can call ta so V is going to be V naught over 3 equaling to V naught E power negative T divided by RSC which is 3.3 .3. okay so I have that 1 over 3 equals to E power negative T divided by 3.3 .3. so I introduce ln so ln of 1 over 3 will just give me the power which is minus T over 3.3 .3. so what is T I'll just press my calculator ln of 1 divided by 3 is negative times 3.3 .3. then I divide by negative 1 so this is 3.63 so the time is going to be 3.63 okay a second identical capacitor is connected in parallel with the first capacitor state and explain the change if any to the time constant of the discharge so the time constant remember is equal to r times c the time constant tau normally i use i want to use capital t yes ta for the time constant time constant tau is r times c a second capacitor is in parallel when capacitance is in parallel total capacitance is the sum so the capacitance has increased that means the time constant must increase state and explain the change if any to the time constant of the discharge circuit so because the capacitors are identical it means the capacitance has been doubled so that means the time constant should also be doubled so total capacitance is doubled total capacitance total capacitance has been doubled so the time constant doubles or the time constant is doubled okay time constant is doubled I think next should be magnetism a small solenoid of of cross-sectional area 1.6 times 10 to the power of a minus 3 meters squared is placed inside a large solenoid of area 6.4 as shown in the figure 
the largest solenoid has 600 tons and is attached to a DC power supply to create a magnetic field. The smaller solenoid has 300 tons. Compare the magnetic flux in the two solenoids. So for flux, I will use phi is equal to BA. If B is constant, then flux is directly proportional to area. The one with the larger area has a bigger flux. So the area of um, the area for the small uh, solenoid is smaller, and the area for the larger solenoid is bigger. So for the same magnetic flux, for the same magnetic field, magnetic flux is directly proportional to area. So um, the flux, magnetic flux, is less in a smaller solenoid. Less in a smaller solenoid, or you could say it is greater in a larger solenoid. Is it called larger or bigger in a larger solenoid? The reason is very simple. We have said flux is equal to B times A. It is directly proportional to the area. Flux is directly proportional to the area. Then compare the magnetic flux linkage. Now, flux linkage depends on the product of the area and the magnetic field. So, flux linkage flux linkage is equal to N B A. If we assume B is constant, so it is going to be Directed proportion to n times a. So let's check. For the smaller solenoid, n times a is equal to 300 times 1.6 times 10 to the power of minus 3, which is 300 times 1.6. That is 480. 4, 8 times 1 exponent minus 3, 0 0.48. That is the product of n times area. Then this side, it is the product of n times area is going to be 600 times 6.4 times 10 to the power of minus 3, which is or 600 times 6.4 divide by a thousand so this is 3.84 so it means flux linkage is bigger in the larger coil compared to the smaller coil so we we'll simply say it is greater in this uh, What did I do? So this was 1,000, 3,000, 3,000 times 1.6 divided by 1,000. Sorry about that. Sorry, divide by 1,000. 3,000 times 1.6 divided by 1,000. Sorry, this is 4.8, not 0 0.48. So this is 4.8 and the other one is 3.84. So you see that flux is bigger, is that the product n times a is bigger for a smaller solenoid than for larger solenoid. So it means flux linkage is greater in the smaller solenoid. So it is greater in a smaller in a smaller solenoid. Or you could say the opposite is less in the largest one with as simple as that state lens is low of course lens is low is about direction and the faraday's laws are about uh, magnitude so simply say direction of induced emf
is such as to produce effects that oppose the change that caused it. So always the direction of the induced EMF is always is such as to produce effects that oppose the change which caused it. Or the direction of the induced EMF is always such as to cause effects or to produce effects that oppose the change producing it or causing it. That is uh, Faraday's, I mean Lenz's law. Remember Faraday's law is about the magnitude. The magnitude of the induced EMF is directly proportional to the rate of change of magnetic flux linkage. That is Faraday's law. The terminals of the smaller solenoid are connected together. Okay, so that means we expect an induced EMF in the smaller solenoid that it causes a complete circuit. The smaller solenoid is then removed from inside the larger solenoid. If it is removed, there is now motion. So it means the smaller solenoid is cutting the magnetic field in the larger solenoid. So by Faraday's law, an EMF must be induced. With reference to magnetic fields, explain why a force is needed to remove the smaller solenoid. Okay. So uh, when we move, when we try to withdraw the smaller solenoid, we are, we are cutting the magnetic field. So there's a change in flux linkage in the smaller solenoid, which induces an EMF in the smaller solenoid. But uh, of course, the induced EMF results into a current, and the induced current in the smaller solenoid causes a field around the smaller solenoid. Of course, if the two fields interact, then they will cause an attractive force to prevent the, so the smaller coil from moving away from the larger coil, according to Lenz's law. So, I'll simply say, um, moving the smaller solenoid, moving smaller solenoid, causes a change causes a change of flux linkage in the smaller solenoid smaller solenoid which induces which induces an EMF in the smaller solenoid the induced emf gives rise to an induced current or i will simply say the induced current in the smaller solenoid causes a field around the smaller solenoid the induced current in the smaller solenoid causes a field around it and in accordance, of course, to Lenz's law, the two fields are going to interact, but they are going to cause an attractive force to oppose the movement of the solenoid, the small solenoid away. The induced current, the small solenoid, causes a field around it, and let me just say, causes a field around it, the two fields interact.
the two fields interact. To create an attractive force. which tends to oppose moving uh, the smaller solenoid which tends to move uh, to oppose moving the smaller solenoid away So they used um, the two fields. There's one field which is due to the large solenoid and another field which has been created due to the induced current. Now these two fields are going to interact and they're going to cause uh, an, a force or two, uh, they're going to cause an attractive force which tends to oppose moving the smaller solenoid away from, from the larger solenoid. That is in accordance to Lenz's law. So this is according to Lenz's what? Lenz's law. Okay. I think that is the end of magnetic fields. Maybe next is oh, it is alternating current. Alternating current is converted into direct current using a full wave rectification circuit. Part of the diagram of the circuit is complete. Um, complete the circuit in the figure by adding the necessary components in the gaps. Of course, you should be able to draw. I'm going to first complete this. We normally draw these symbols wrongly. There should be a straight line through. Now for the bridge rectifier, uh, the diamond, uh, the, the, the what? The, the diodes, two, two, par two opposite diodes always point in the same direction. But that is not always the case. You should also check if the circuit is complete, if you make them point in the same direction. For example, I'm going to draw a diode here, which points in the same direction as the diode here, the diode on the other side, far opposed to this one. They are pointing in the same direction. I'll also draw another one here, which point in the same direction as the other one. You can use a ruler to draw a better diagram. But you have to check and see if the circuit is complete. So let me check. If the first half cycle this is positive, current takes goes through this diode, it will not go this side. It will not take this route, it enters from the top, which makes this one to be positive, and this will be negative. So current continues like this. It can't go back to where it started from, so it will take this path. It reaches here, it can't go back to where it started from, so it continues and it it comes back to this so that is complete for the second half cycle change color let me use red remember this was negative the other one was positive so this becomes negative this is positive so current now changes direction it follows this path when it reaches here it can't take this path it will continue this side so it continues and enters from the top it comes, it can't go back to where it started from, so it can't take this path. So it will take this path and it reaches this path until it comes back to negative. So it means my circuit is correct. So draw this with a pencil so that you can easily check to see if it is complete. So you have to check before you be sure that your circuit is, is working. So I've checked and I've known that my current is always entering from the top part, so it is working. Okay. Then on the figure mark with a plus, the positive terminal of the amplifier, so current enters from the top, so I'll put a plus up here. The output voltage V of an SC power supply varies sinusoidally with the time as shown in the figure. Okay. So it is a sine curve. Determine the equation for V 
in terms of T, where V is in volts and T is in seconds. So, of course, we know the general equation V is equal to V naught sine omega T. So, all we need is to find omega. So, we know that omega is equal to 2 pi divided by the period, which will be 2 pi divided by T. From the graph, what is T? From the graph, I see uh, this is half, I think. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So this is in the center, so this is going to be uh, 2.5. So T is 2.5. So this is going to be 2.5. And when I press my calculator, 2 pi divided by 2.5, that is approximately 2. What are the units here? Two pi divide by I think this is two point five. Okay, that is 2.5. This is going to be radians per second, okay. So that is 2.5 radians per second. Then, um, so I have omega. Then I'm only remaining with the V naught. I will just look at the graph V naught. So the scale is 2 divided by 10, which is 0 0.2. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 and a half. 7 times 0 0.2 is that. Then plus 0 0.1, because it's a half. So that is 1.5 plus 2. So it is 3.5. So this is 3.5 here. That is the amplitude, 3.5. So the amplitude V naught is going to be 3.5 volts. So now I have to rewrite my equation as V equals 3.5 sine of uh, 2.5 times T. So V equals to 3.5 sine of 2.5 times t as simple as that you can write a different format but that's that's fine the supply is connected to a 12 ohm resistor capture the mean power so we want average power so since this is alternating if i use uh, the equation uh, uh, the dc equation i must make sure i use the root mean square values for example p Equal, if I use P is equal to V squared over R, because this is alternating, V must be the root mean square value. But also remember, the root mean square value is going to be, the root mean square value of voltage is going to be, is V naught, uh, is V naught over root of 2. The root mean square value is V naught over root of 2. So when this is squared, this is going to be squared. So it means uh, the mean power, the average power is going to be equal to V naught squared divided by, of course, this one is V naught squared over 2. So I substitute for V root mean square squared, so it will be V naught squared over 2 times R. So I'm going to find average. This is the mean power, by the way. If I find mean power using the DC values, I must get the equivalent DC values, which are the root mean square values. So the minimum, the uh, peak was 3.5 squared over 2 times R. R is 12 ohms. So I'll just press my calculator. 3.5 squared divided by 2 times 12, which is 0 0.51. So this is 0. 51 watts.
so this is going to be 0 0.51 watts if you want you can first compute v root mean square and then substitute in the formula but this is the same thing so 0 0.51 watts is the answer oh that was sc next is quantum physics okay state the formula for the de broglie wavelength lambda of uh, a moving particle so we know that de broglie wavelength lambda is equal to h over p which is momentum or you can write h over mv so i'll write just h over p mv is momentum which is mass times the speed of the particle so i'll write one of them so i'll say de broglie wavelength is equal to h divided by p then they said state the meaning of any of the symbols used. So lambda has already been mentioned, I can't repeat it. So I will say H is Planck's constant and P is the momentum of the particle. P is momentum of the particle. Is momentum of the particle. Electrons accelerate through a potential difference. Electrons accelerate through a PD, pass through a thin crystal, and are then incident on a fluorescent screen. The pattern in the figure is observed on the fluorescent screen. Say so the name of the phenomenon shown by the electrons are the crystal. So this is these are concentric rings which are diffraction patterns. So this is going to be electron diffraction. So to be specific, this is electron diffraction. State, the, uh, state what this phenomenon shows about the nature of electrons. If I sh uh, remember, diffraction is a property of waves. So it, if moving electrons are showing diffraction, and so they are behaving like waves. So we say moving electrons show diffraction, and so behave like waves. Moving electrons moving electrons show diffraction and so behave like so they behave like waves moving electrons show diffraction and so they behave like and so they behave like waves so just why the thin crystal causes the phenomenon b why does the thin crystal cause the phenomenon now that text us to waves diffraction is maximum when the wavelength is approximately the same as the size of the gap so if moving electrons show diffraction when they pass through a crystal, it's only because interatomic or inter interatomic spacing is the same as the wavelength of the crystals. So we say the wavelength of wavelength or the Broglie wavelength of electrons, wavelength of electrons is approximately of the same order as the spacing between the atoms. is approximately of the same order as the spacing between atoms. Remember the spacing between atoms is approximately 10 to the power of negative 10 meters. And the wavelength of electron is approximately 10 to the power of negative 11 meters. So the interatomic spacing is approximately the same as the wavelength of the electrons or the de Broglie wavelength of the electrons. So since they are approximately the same size, the uh, electrons will uh, easily undergo diffraction. Okay. The electrons, the electron is accepted through a different potential difference. The new pattern observed on the screen is shown in the figure so we see that uh, the field the, the, uh, the what uh, the radius has reduced which means the diffraction angle has reduced remember d sine theta is equal to n times lambda 
the diffraction angle has reduced because we see the radius has become smaller. The radius of the patterns has become small, which means the diffraction angle has reduced, which means the wavelength has decreased. And remember, the wavelength is equal to h over the momentum. If the wavelength has decreased, it means the momentum has increased. Also remember from a half, m v squared equals to e times the accelerating pd. When I multiply both sides by m, it means m, v, m squared v squared is equal to twice e times v times m. Capital V is accelerating PD. This one is momentum squared equals twice E accelerating PD times M. So if I find the square root, momentum is equal to the square root of twice E accelerating PD times M. So the momentum, because the momentum has been increased, it means, uh, and remember momentum is directly proportional to the root of V. Increase in momentum means the root of V has increased, so V has actually increased. So state and explain the change that has been made to the potential difference of cost has been increased. So we can just put all this in, in, in watts and say the wavelength has decreased. The wavelength has decreased. So I've seen that the wavelength has decreased because the radius, uh, the radius has decreased. So the wavelength has decreased, and what does that mean? Meaning, um, the electron had a greater momentum. Meaning, an uh, electron had greater momentum. And note that momentum is, um, wavelength is inversely proportional to momentum. So the wavelength has decreased, which means the electron had a greater momentum. That is one. And momentum is directly proportional to the root of the PD. So the potential difference has increased. So the accelerating PD. So the accelerating PD was increased. Okay, so that was uh, quantum physics. Diffraction grating is always easy. I mean, uh, the blue wavelength is always easy. Next is nuclear physics. Plutonium decays by alpha emission. Of course, we know alpha is 4, 2. To form a stable isotope of lead. So I'm just going to balance. Proton number should be 84 minus 2, which gives us 82. Nuclear number will be 211 minus 4, which is going to give us 207. Complete the equation for this decay, so we have completed that. The variation with the time t of the number of unstable nuclei n in a sample of polonium, polonium is shown here. Okay, so this is number of polonium with the time. Okay, a time t equals to the sample contains only polonium so at equals so we only have polonium that means the number of um, alpha particles emitted or lead is equal to zero at t equals to zero the figure use the figure to determine the decay constant lambda of polonium give a unit with your answer so decay constant so first of all we know that decay constant lambda is equal to ln of two divided by t a half where t a half is the half life. The k constant is ln of 2 over t a half. So I need to find the half life. So half life is going to be equal to, I will look for half life from the graph. So we start with n equals 24, divided by 2, it becomes n. So this is going to be 12. So 12. I will find this 12, okay, so this is 0 0.42444648552, 5, so this is 0 0.52, I will repeat again with 6 if it is possible, 6, so this is 1.4, which is going to be 1.8. So 1.2, 1.4. 
So I can find the average. Half-life is going to be 0 0.52 plus um, This is first half-life, second half-life. So 0 0.5, I can check 1.4 divided by 2, which is still 0 0.52. So the half-life is 0 0.52. The half-life is 0 0.52. So I can say 0 0.52 plus 1.4 over 2. And again, I divide this by 2. So which is still 0 0.52. Or you can just take one value as 0 0.52 as the half-life. I just repeated to, to make sure that it is the same if I obtain the average. So the half-life is 0 0.52 seconds. So I just substitute. The k constant is going to be ln of 2 divided by 0 0.52. And this is in seconds. ln of 2 divided by 0 0.52. So that's 1.33. So this is 1.33. The units are going to be 1 over seconds, which is per second. Okay. Use your answer in B to calculate the activity at t equals to 0 of the sample of polonium. Of course, we know that activity is equal to lambda times n. So lambda is 1.33 times n. N at t equals to 0 was 24, so it is 24 times 10 to the power of, what is the power of 10? Power 12. So it is 24 times 10 to the power of 12. So I'll just say 1.33 times 24, exponent 12. So that is 3.19 times 10 to the power of 13. 3.1 9 times 10 to the power of 13. On the figure, sketch a line to show uh, the variation with the T of the number of lead nuclei in the sample. Of course, at T equals to 0, N is 24, and small n is going to be 0. At T equals so our graph is going to start from 0, 0. Before emission, our graph starts from 0, 0. Then, I will use this point, this part here. At t equals to 0, n equals to 0. Then I will check half-life. At t equals to uh, 0 0.52, n should also be half of 24. So n is going to be 12. Because uh, 24 has reduced to half, it has a given out uh, 12 times 10 to the power 12 alpha particles. So our next point is going to be here. Our next point is going to be 0 0.52 and 12. Then uh, I will not check 1.4. Okay, I will can check t equals to 1.4. At t equals to 1.4. What is n? So these have reduced to 6. So it means they have meted, emitted 24 min minus 6, which is a 24 minus eight, uh, 6, which is going to be 18. So it, have, it has emitted 18 particles. So, so 1.4 is 18. 1.4 is 18. So 1.4 is 18. I think this is the point. Let me check. 18. Okay. So our graph will touch here. Let me check uh, at 1.2. At 1.2, how many particles have been emitted? So at 1.2, we have uh, 4. 2 divided by 5 is 0 0.4. So 4.4, 4.8, 5.2. This is 5.2. So I have 24 minus 5.2, which is, I think, 18.8. So at equals to 1.2 n is going to be 24 minus 5 point which is 18.8 so my graph should stop at 18.8 so 18.8 so this is 18.4.8 is here because each small box is 0 0.4 okay 
so my graph touches there so i'm now going to sketch the graph i may remove the lines now because i don't need some of these lines okay so i'm going to use green so you must make sure that your graph is a smooth curve which goes through uh, this point here and it continues through this point here up to this point okay so it should be a smooth curve it should be a smooth curve so for the number of particles which have been emitted so we're sketching the variation with the time of the number of lead nuclei in the sample so as the number of nuclei present for polonium decrease the number of nuclei for lead increase as simple as that each decay releases an alpha particle with energy 6 900 kilo electron volts so the energy of each is 9 6 900 kilo electron volts calculate in joules the total energy of uh, the total energy given to an alpha particle or given to alpha particles that are emitted between t equals to 0 to t equals to um, T, between t equals 0 0.30 to t equals 0 0.90. This, how many alpha particles are those? t equals to 0 0.3. So 0 0.3, we have 16. And t equals 0 0.9. Zero point nine. I think this is 7.2. So how many alpha particles are those? I'll just subtract. So here we have uh, 16 times 10 to the power of 12. And here we have 7.2 times 10 to the power of 12. Okay, so the difference in that is equal to the number of decays. And remember, each decay is giving an alpha particle. So I will say the number of decays. Between that time is going to be 16 times 10 to the power of 12 minus 7.2 times 10 to the power of 12. That is the number of decays. Remember, each decay gives an alpha particle. So the energy is going to be the number of decays times the energy of each alpha particle. So the energy is going to be 16 times 10 to the power of 12 minus 7.2 times 10 to the power of 12. That is the number of decays times remember i'm saying each decay gives an alpha particle so times the energy of each alpha particle which is 6900 but is in kilo so i change it to electron volts then i change it to joules that will be times 1.6 times 10 to the power of minus 19 to change it to joules so i'll have 16 minus 7.2 so this is times one exponent 12 to just bring the power of 10 times 6 900 uh, exponent 3 times 1.6 exponent minus 19 so that is 9.72 so this is 9.72 So I'll write here 9.72 joules. Suggest so why the total amount of energy released by the decay process between time t equals 0 0.3 and time t equals 0 0.9 is greater than your answer in C. My answer in C is 9.7, and they are saying to suggest why total energy is going to be greater. Why total energy is going to be greater? Of course, of course, uh, the um, Lead nuclei is emitted, it is going to be given some kinetic energy, and many times gamma ray, gamma ray photon could be accompanying that reaction. So we can say lead nuclei also have kinetic energy. The lead nuclei have kinetic energy.
So this one is what goes to the uh, the gamma to the alpha particles, but the lead nuclei also have kinetic energy, and then gamma ray photons could also be emitted. So I could say gamma photons. Gamma photons are also emitted. So remember, gamma photons is basically electromagnetic radiation, which is basically energy. So gamma photons are also emitted. Okay. I think that was nuclear physics. Maybe next could be medical physics. In an X-ray tube, electrons are accepted through a potential difference of 75 kilo electron volts. The electrons then strike a tangential target of effective mass 15 grams. The electrons, I mean the electron energy is converted into the energy of the X-ray photon with an efficiency of 5%. So efficiency is 5%. So that means what is useful is 5%, and what is the rest of the energy is converted into thermal energy. So the energy which becomes the thermal must be 95%. If 5% becomes, uh, if 5% is the one which is useful, then the rest which becomes thermal energy is 95% and remember the thermal energy is the one which will increase the temperature. The X-ray tube produces an image using a current of 0.4 for a time of 20 milliseconds. So this is the current and this is the time. The specific heat capacity of tungsten is 130, so this is C. Determine the temperature rise uh, of the tungsten. So the amount of heat which raises the temperature Q is given by M C times change in temperature, and this is 95% of the energy supplied. So this is going to be 95% of E. E is the energy which is supplied, and energy supplied is equal to power times time, which is going to be IV times T. So Q is equal to 95% of E. Q is 95% of E, so I'm just going to equate these two equations. I, just, I don't even need to rewrite this here. So what energy which raises the temperature is 95% of the energy supplied. So I'll simply say MC times change in temperature is equal to 95 over 100 of E, which is IV times T. So the temperature rise is going to be 0 0.95 times I, which is 0 0.40 times V, which is, I think V was 75 kilovolts, so that is 75,000. Then the time was 20 milliseconds, which is 20 times 10 to the power of minus 3, divide by MC. The mass is 15 grams, so that is 15 times 10 to the power of minus 3, then times C, which is 130. I just made delta T the subject by dividing both sides. Okay, I'll cancel out minus 3 for simplicity. So 0 0.95 times 0 0.4 times 75,000 times 20. Divide by 15 times 130. So that is 292, which is approximately 290. So this is uh, 292. To three significant figures, it is 292 Kelvin. Okay. The linear attenuation coefficient of the X ray photons in muscle is 0 0.22. Catching the thickness T of muscle that will absorb 80%. 80% is absorbed, that means what is transmitted is 20%. Intensity transmitted is 20%. So remember, intensity transmitted is equal to the incident intensity e power negative mu times x, where x is the thickness. Okay, so intensity transmitted is 20% of, of the incident intensity, so I will say 0 or 20 percent this is the same as 0 0.2 i naught so i'll say 0 0.2 i naught is equal to i naught 
e power negative. We are calculating the thickness. Mu is given as 0.22 per centimeter times x. I've just said dot x. So introduce uh, I note has cancelled. Introducing ln, I'll say ln of 0 0.2 is equal to the power negative 0 0.22 per centimeter times x. So if I make x the subject, x is going to be ln of 0 0.2 divided by negative 0 0.22 per centimeter. So the units will be centimeters. I'll just press the calculator. ln of 0 0.2 divide by negative 0 0.22 so that is 7.3 so t or oh, thickness is 7.3 oh the thickness they use the t i'll just change this to t it doesn't change anything because i'm used to using x so this is t times t times t so t is 7.3 okay table 10.1 shows the linear attenuation coefficient mu for the x-ray photons in different tissues two x-ray images are taken one of equal thickness of bone and muscle and another of equal thickness of blood and muscle. Explain why one of the images has good contrast but the other does not. Okay, let me just explain good contrast first. So one is for bone and muscle. Look at bone and muscle. You notice that uh, the absorption coefficient for bone is much different from that for muscle. So the absorption properties are different. So the amount of X-rays absorbed by bone is much different than, than, than that absorbed by muscle. So that will give good contrast. So I will say mu, mu uh, for bone is much greater. Oh, it is different. Mu for muscle. So, bone and muscle absorb very different amounts of x-rays, very different amounts of x-rays hence good contrast as long as there is a different extent to which different organs absorb x-rays the contrast is always good hence good contrast if you want to explain the other part for for blood and the other one is for blood and muscle look at their values this and this so Mu for, for blood and muscle is almost similar. Mu for blood and muscle is almost similar. Almost similar. Mu for blood and muscle is almost similar. So blood and muscle absorb almost similar amounts of x-rays absorb almost similar amounts of x-rays so we conclude that i will say hence poor contrast hence poor contrast 
So that's why the contrast is good for bone and muscle, but it's poor for blood and, and muscle. Okay, so contrast depends on how different organs absorb um, X-rays to different extents. I think we are still in medical physics. Okay, post-tone emission tomography, that is PET scanning, obtains diagnostic information from a person. The information is used to form an image. PET scanning uses a tracer. Of course, we know that a tracer is, uh, for example, we have fluorofluorine, which is injected into the body, fluorine 18, which is normally injected into the body, the patient's body, to help in diagnosis. That is a tracer. So what is a tracer? We can say a tracer is a substance containing radioactive nuclei. Substance containing radioactive radioactive nuclei that is introduced into the body that is introduced into the body or the patient's body and absorbed by the tissue being studied. It is normally absorbed by the tissue being studied and absorbed by the tissue being studied. That is uh, a tracer. PET scanning involves an, uh, annihilation. Of course, we know that annihilation, the positron and the, um, and the electron interact and their mass becomes energy. So a particle and its corresponding antiparticle interact and so that their mass is converted into energy. So we can say a particle interacting with its antiparticle so that their mass is converted so that their mass is converted into energy. So be very careful when you are explaining annihilation. The mass must be converted into energy, which is in the form of gamma ray photons. So which particles are involved in the annihilation process during the PET scan? Of course, these are the electrons. Electrons and positrons. Electrons and the positrons. I think many students don't see the, the spelling of positron. Electrons and the positrons. Then calculate the total energy released in one annihilation. Of course, one annihilation gives two gamma ray photons. It gives two gamma photons. And it, of course, we are bringing an electron plus an electron which is negative plus a positron and the energy of each electron is mc squared so there are two so total energy is going to be twice so energy is going to be m twice mc squared which is going to be two times the mass of one particle which is an electron or positron which is 9.11 times 10 to the power of minus 31 then times the speed of light which is 3 times 10 to the power of 8 and this is going to be squared Okay, so I have 2 times 9.11, 2 times 9.11 exponent minus 31, then times 3 exponent 8, but this should be squared. So the total energy is 1.64 times 10 to the power of minus 13 joules. So it is 1.64 times 10 to the power of minus 13 joules. 
capture the wavelength of each gamma photon released. Remember, this energy is for two gamma photons. So for one photon, you should either divide this energy by two, or you can still recompute it. You know that energy of a single photon is equal to H C over lambda. H C over lambda. And energy of a single photon still energy of one electron, one particle is mc squared. So this is for a single photon. This is energy for one electron or one either a positron or um, either a positron or or uh, an electron. Remember that we have two for two particles whose mass combines. I mean, uh, two particles whose mass becomes two gamma ray photons, which is twice H F. Or we have the two cancels out, so we have M C squared equaling to H C over lambda, as simple as that. So the wavelength is going to be equal to H C divided by M C squared, or you can capture the wavelength from H divided by M times C. 6.63 and 10 to the power of minus 34 divided by 9.11 times 10 to the power of minus 31 then times 3 times 10 to the power of 8 so this would be 6.63 exponent minus 34 divided by 9.11 exponent minus 31 divided by 3 exponent 8 so that is 2.43 times 10 to the power of minus 12. Meters. So this is 2.43 times 10 to the power of minus 12 meters. Alternatively, I said you can divide the other energy by 2. So the energy is going to be 1.64 times 10 to the power of minus 13 divided by 1 photon. Of, yes, for one photon and down, then you equate this to H C over wavelength. So you equate that to H C over wavelength. So it is going to take you to the same thing. So this is alternatively. So the wavelength is going to be 2 times 6.63 times 10 to the power of minus 34 times 3 times 10 to the power of 8 divided by 1.64 times 10 to the power of minus 13. I'm sure the answer is going to be 2.43 times 10 to the power of minus 12 to be the same answer, or approximately the same. So you can check the second one. Explain how the gamma photons are used to produce the image. Of course, now we need the gamma photons. These ones move in opposite directions in what your teacher must have called the line of response and they are detected by detectors or gamma camera outside the body. These ones arrive at different times depending on where they are coming from. So the arrival time is used to uh, determine the location where they are produced. And the arrival time is used to produce uh, an image of, their, of the tracer concentration in the tissue. Okay. So remember there are two gamma photons. So I will say the two gamma photons the two gamma photons travel. The two gamma photons travel in opposite direction. And They are detected and are detected by detectors outside the body. The two gamma photons travel in opposite directions and they are detected by detectors outside the body. So the gamma photons um the gamma photons arrive at the detector arrive at different times at, 
Okay, they will say the gamma photons. Arrive at detectors. At different times. So they arrive at different times, and the arrival time determines where they are coming from anyway. So I will say the arrival time the arrival time determines the location. of production of these photons of these gamma photons the arrival time determines the location of production determines the location of production of these gamma Photons. So this, of course, the arrival the arrival time is used to produce an image. The arrival. Why am I failing to write R? I think I'm very tired. So the arrival. The arrival time is used to produce an image of the tracer concentration Tracer concentration in the tissue. So the arrival time is used to produce an image of the tracer concentration in the tissue. So that would give you full credit. I think last it should be astronomy and cosmology. State what is meant by luminosity. Of course, we know luminosity is total radiant power emitted by the star. So this is going to be total radiant power emitted by a star total radiant power emitted by a star the luminosity of the sun is 3 times 10 to 3.83 exponent 26 the distance between the earth and the sun is 1.5 1 times 10 to the power 11 meters catch with the radiant flux intensity f so we know that the radiant flux intensity is simply given by l over 4 by d squared, where d is the distance. So I'll just substitute 3.83 times 10 to the power of 26 divided by 4 pi into 1.51 times 10 to the power of 11, and this is squared. 3.83 exponent 26 divided by 4 pi times I'll open another bracket 1.51 exponent 11. So I have to close to square the first bracket, then close. So this is giving 1336.7, 1336.7, or approximately 1340. The unit is going to be, of course, uh, radiant flux intensity. Of course, this is intensity so it is watts per meter squared so that is watts per meter squared use data from b to calculate the mass that is converted into energy every second in the sun so we know that energy is going to be mc squared we want the mass so the mass is going to be the energy which is given as the which is um, 
we have of course the energy is power times time energy is power times time so we want energy converted every second so the power is 3.83 times 10 to the power of 26 the time is one second divide by c squared which is 3 times 10 to the power of 8 and this is squared so this is going to be 3.83 exponent 26 divide by 3 exponent 8 but this is squared so this is 4.26 times 10 to the power of 3 6 9 so this is 4.26 times 10 to the power of 9 kilograms 4.26 times 10 to the power of 9 kilograms the radius of the sun is 6.96 times 10 to the power of 80 meters show that the temperature t of the surface of the sun is 5770 kelvin so the equation which relates temperature to luminosity is L equals to 4 pi. This equation is given in the list of formula. L equals to 4 pi times uh, Stefan Boltzmann's constant times R squared T power 4. The luminosity was given at 3.83 times 10 to the power of 26. This is going to be equal to 4 pi. Of course, we know Stefan Boltzmann's constant. You can check in the list of constants, but is 5. 0.67 times 10 to the power of I think it is negative 8 yes it is negative 8 then times the radius has been given as 6.96 times 10 to the power of 8 this is squared then times t to the power of 4 so I want t to the power of 4 I'm just going to press my calculator and I will find the square root twice that will be t to the power of finding the fourth root so let me press my calculator first i'll say 3.83 exponent 26 okay i'm dividing both sides now i'll start by dividing with 4 pi i'll put a bracket here 4 pi times 5.67 exponent negative 8 Okay, then again I will divide by open another bracket 6.96 exponent 8, but this should be squared. So I'm finding that t power 4 is 1.1096 1 5 times 10 to the power of 15. So I have to find the fourth root both sides. Fourth root find the fourth root to both sides so I'm going to find the root no 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 I'm going to find the root so this should be fourth root of of the answer fourth root of the answer which is 577 so this is 5771.6 so t is 5771.6 which is approximately 5770 kelvin okay be careful when you're finding the fourth root and lastly i think i went i've gone through by five minutes the wavelength lambda max of light for which the maximum rate of emission occurs from the sun is 5 times 10 to the power of minus 7 meters. The temperature of the surface of uh, the star Ceres is 9940. Use information from D to determine the wavelength of light for which the maximum rate of emission occurs from Ceres. Okay, so we know that uh, by Stefan, uh, by Wayne's displacement law, lambda maximum. Is directly inversely proportional to the absolute temperature so it means lambda max times absolute temperature is equal to a constant okay so lambda max times absolute temperature should be a constant so using um, the sun 
lambda max for the sine is 5.00 times 10 to the power of minus 7. The temperature of the sun we have calculated as 5770 should be equal to lambda max for Ceres, which we don't know. I'll just call it lambda times the surface temperature, which is 9940. So it means lambda is going to be 5770 divided by 9940 times 5 times 10 to the power of minus 7. Okay, so I'll just press my calculator. 5770 divided by 9940 times 5 exponent minus 7. So I am getting 2.90 times 10 to the power of minus 7. 2.90 times 10 to the power of minus 7 meters. 2.90 times 10 to the power of minus 7 meters. So note very carefully your answers should always be to a minimum of two significant figures unless asked or unless it is uncertainties, absolute uncertainties. Okay, so until next time, bye-bye.